from the Shrewsbury 24 Gates. Can I first of all congratulate Bertha on a wonderful weekend of celebration? The Shrewsbury 24 campaign, I make no apologies now for just going back through a bit of history. Because it's the longest campaign that you could ever con consider. We've been campaigning now for 43 years. 43 years for justice. It came about by a national building workers strike which happened in 1972. In 1972, every building worker in the country came together and gelled. And that's got to be a first for, any, for anything at all because they're so fragmented as an industry. They're fragmented all over the place. But there were certain sites that were still working. And in North Wales, and we were part of the Chester Action Committee, Chester North Wales, we received a call from our comrades in Oswald Street in Shropshire if we could go and give them a hand. And on September the 6th, 1972, three coast roads went up from North Wales to Oswald Street. We met at Oswald Street Labour Club to discuss the problems that was happening in the Oswald Street uh, General Shropshire area. Another coach joined us there from Chester, so there were four coaches in all. At that meeting in the Labour Club in Oswald Street, it was agreed that we would travel the A5, and we're going back now to think 1972, we travel the A5 to look for sites that were still working. On the first site that we came to, a site called Kingswood, we got off the coach, and the, 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 the format was you'd get off the coach, a couple would go to the site agent's cabin, ask the site agent for a meeting with the, with the lads who were working on the job, we'd have the meeting and then we'd move on. And nine times out of ten, those people would join us when the case was explained to them. At Kingswood, as a few of the lads went to the site agent's cabin, the site agent came out with a loaded shotgun and directed the barrels at the pickets that were going to the cabin to the cabin to talk to him. A few of the other lads got off the coaches, they surrounded the site agent, they took the gun off him, peacefully by the way, they took the gun, they broke the barrel, took the cartridges out. And lo and behold, we were surrounded by police officers. Now we didn't know we were going there. We had no idea, as a group of workers from North Wales, that that's where we were going. That was the extent of the conspiracy. So the gun was now given to the police officers, they took charge of it. And from that point on, the police officers, approximately 80, <coughs> some on motorbikes, some in cars, they took us around Shrewsbury to different sites. They took us because they said we know where the sites are so we'll take you there. And police officers took us to every site on that day. The biggest site on that day was a site called Brookside. And it was Telford Newtown getting under construction. Brookside was a big house in the States with a school and a community centre on it and it was being built by a contractor called Robert McAlpine. Huh. Now there's a name to conjure with. <laughs> on that job, because it was such a big job and there were six site cabins with six site agents, it had separate agents for each part of the, part of the scheme. So we broke up into gangs and we went to the different cabins <laughs> to seek again permission from the contractor through the site agents to have a meeting with the men. We had that meeting with the men on the site. And by the way, there was a man on that site called Clifford Crocott, who was actually photographed at all the meetings. He's photographed at different angles. 
Lishman later on, later on, said that he'd been beaten up on the day by, by somebody with a house brick and had the back of his skull broken open and lost the sight of his eye. But this was before the meetings took place. It was actually when we entered the site, he said. But he's photographed on all that, not by our photographers, by the way, but by the Shropshire Star photographer. To finish off on that day, the senior officer in charge, uh, Chief Inspector Meredith from the West Mercia Police, got on the coach that Des Warren and Ricky Tomlinson was on. He got on the coach and he wished us, well, first of all, he said, thanks for the way you've conducted yourselves today. You've done well. And could I wish you all a safe journey home? Those were the parting words of the most senior officer on that day. So we left there then. About a week later, approximately one week later, the strike came to an end. All the contractors through the National Federation of uh, Building Trade Employers, that's the NFBT, through, the, through that organisation, they agreed to the claims for the money and they agreed to the claims for the health and safety and welfare on, on the work. And by the way, when we talk about health and safety, on average, there was one person killed every working day. One person was killed every working day in those early 70s. That was part of the strike, to stop that carnage that was happening on site and get better welfare conditions such as cabins and dryer rooms, which were non-existent on most sites and indeed still are today. Five months after the end of the strike, Five months after, officers from West Mercia swooped on properties in North Wales and started arresting pickets who'd been to, who'd been to Shropshire on September the 6th, 1972. They took the lads, I was included as one of those, and by the way, and the, and the babe, believe it or not, and the youngest of the 24. They took them back to police stations, some in Shrewsbury, some in uh, Hollywood, some in Flint, some in, Rex in Wrexham. They took them to different places, started questioning them about activities on the day. And arising from that, 24 of us were committed for trial at Shrewsbury Crown Court. We had a committal here in March of 1973. And at that committal hearing, <coughs> there was over 2,000 police officers on duty and on about parade in the streets. They'd filled the public gallery in the courts, they'd circled the courts. <coughs> Somebody had to give the, the, give the order for that <coughs> because I know damn well that West Mercia do not employ 2,000 officers. So 2,000 officers at least were on uh, duty on that day. And it made us look to the general public in Shrewsbury that we were the biggest gangsters <coughs> age. That's what it made it look like. We had that committal hearing in March 1973 and 24 of us were committed at one hearing. <coughs> then came the, the uh, actual further charges came through the post following that committal hearing. The charges came out, uh, as an example, there was charges of conspiracy, and it was conspiracy to intimidate people to abstain from their lawful employment. So that word intimidate, isn't it? Because every time you go on a picket line, you're there to encourage those people to join you in your struggle. That's the whole idea of picketing, but they put in the word intimidate. And it was an 1875 act. Bear in mind 1831, what happened down here. Under that act, if found guilty, it was deportation to the colonies. That, that's what, if you were guilty, it was deportation. 
So we were chaired under that 1875 Act of intimidating people to abstain from their lawful employments, of an unlawful assembly, and of an affray. Now if we look at that unlawful assembly, if there's a group of people together, and a, a law officer, or somebody with some power from within the law, says I want you to break up and move on, and you refuse to do so, then you can be charged with a lawful assembly. Not at one stage on September the 6th, 1972, did one officer ask anybody to move on, break it up, anybody's name taken, coast riders spoken to. That didn't happen. Quite contrary. Thanks for your, thanks for your help, lads. Safe journey home. That's what we got. But we had that charge now of unlawful assembly on us. And also causing an affray. Those charges then <coughs> were put forward for hearings at Sulby Crown Court. And then they broke us up into three separate trials. All committed together, but now we've got three separate trials. The first one was Warren and others versus the Crown. Des Warren, God rest the man's soul. Des Warren was put on charge of the conspiracy along with Ricky Tomlinson, Mackenzie Jones, Ken O'Shea, John Carpenter. They, 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 they had these various people in the dock with, with us. And they were found guilty of the affray. Having sent the jury home, by the way, well, not home, the judge sent the jury to a hotel for the night because they couldn't come to an agreement. And the, the court usher had said to the jury, I don't know what you're worried about, because if you find them guilty, there'll only be a fine, and the unions will pay that. And they were then left to discuss, outside of the jury room, they were then left to discuss in the hotel. And they came back and they, they were found guilty on the majority of 10 to 2. That was on the 19th of December, 1973, just before Christmas. Des Warren, Ricky Tomlinson, Mackie Jones were all sent to prison. Three of them sent to prison. And the worst one was Desi, who was given three years. And while I talk about Desi, he was sent to jail and he served his time in 17 different prisons. His wife would have, Elsa would have a, a visiting order to go and see him in Lincoln Prison and she'd go there with five children to Lincoln to see him, to be told he's not here, he's in Norwich. That was penalising the family as well. And again, that was a government decision. The second trial, which started in January 1974, was a trial called Murray and Others versus the Crown. And that was Adam Murray, one of the building workers. At that second trial, three went to jail again. So another three have gone to jail during the second trial. Then came the third trial, which was Renshaw and others versus the Crown. And fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you look at it, I'd had an accident a couple of days before the course started and broke my leg. And I was in hospital in Brill in North Wales. So on the opening day of the trial, my barrister gave my apologies to the judge. I'm sorry Mr. Renshaw can't be here. He's in hospital with a severely broken leg. The response from the judge was, I want you to check with the hospital if he's fit to travel. And if he's fit to travel, I want him here in the morning. 
All I do is go and pick it in. And they actually took me from my hospital bed to answer the charges. When I got to the court, first thing is a meeting with your QC, your, your counsel. And my counsel begged me to plead guilty to the charges. If you don't plead guilty, you're going down for three years like there's one. Those were the words from my counsel. I was only a young lad of 25. <coughs> my response was, I've no intention of pleading guilty because I'm not guilty of any of those charges that have been put to me. All I did was go pick it in on the day. And I refused to plead guilty. And because I refused to plead guilty, on that day, they put an extra two charges on me. They just, willy nilly, another two charges went on. <coughs> when we got to the, through, through the trial, as it was going through, Monastrate, the prosecution counsel, kept raising the issue of what had gone on on the day and all the intimidation that had happened. And now I hit him with the bombshell. As I'm, I'm, li I'm, I'm virtually lying in, in, the, in the dock with my legs straight out in front of me, in plaster, right to the top of my hip. And I said, you must be mistaken, Mr. Drake, because the date on my chair sheet, I was actually in the hospital on that day having an operation. They put the wrong date on my chair sheet. And I didn't tell anyone, and again, you think of it, I'm a young lad. I didn't tell even my own mother. And then the judge looked at me over his half, I can still see him now over the half in glasses looking at me. And he said, why did you not tell your counsel this? And I said, but if I'd have told my counsel, I think they've told the prosecution counsel. And I'm almost certain they would have come to some form of an agreement. I think you call it plea bargaining. But then they had no option but to drop those first charges on me. They had no option. The judge had to instruct the jury that on the earlier charges that I've been charged with, they had to find me not guilty but then was left these two that they put on another day. And on those two, I was found guilty and given a four month sentence suspended for two years. But as the jury were entitled to consider that, Morris Rake again said to the judge, what shall we do with Mr. Renshaw while the jury are out? Because you're supposed to be now on, on, under the court in the cells. But I'm in plaster up to here. And this is the funny side of it. The judge said, I want you to confiscate his crutches and lock him in the back room of the court. And believe me, that's what they did. Where was I, if I had a mind to run, where was I going to run to? But that's what they did. They took my crutches off me and locked me in the back room and then come back and give me a full and suspended sentence for two years. That's how they treated us. They treated us with the, we, we were the worst of the worst. In fact, what the, the Shropshire Star at one time in its recordings of the, of the trials referred to us as akin to the Cray Twins. Now for those people who are an old relevant, you know who those people were. We were an akin, an akin to the Cray Twins. That's what they thought about us. And all we've done was gone picketing. But we said from the outset, when those charges were levied against us in 1973, we said this is a political trial. The government of the day, Heath's government, book that, nothing to do with politics at all, this is an ordinary criminal trial. Well, I'd like, I'd like anybody in this room to show me an ordinary criminal trial where you've got 2,000 police officers on duty. 
or an ordinary criminal trial where when you're sent to jail you get moved around and moved around and moved around and every time Desi was moved around he had a clear health bill but they were injecting him with the, with the chemical cosh. When Desi was released in 1976, he was suffering from drug-induced Parkinson's. That's what they did to him. He was taking a civil action against the Home Office. They settled out of court. They settled out of court with a gagging order. And then Desi died as a result of drug-induced Parkinson's. These are the things the governments are covering up. So this ordinary criminal trial that they're on about, in 2003, we applied for the papers from the trials. Made an application under the Freedom of Information to have those court papers. And we were told that we couldn't have the papers. Some had been released into the public domain the ones we wanted to see had not been released and were being held under Section 23 of the Freedom of Information Act. A threat to national security. So to release our papers is a threat to national security. And that's been maintained right the way through. They, even today, they maintain that those papers, if they are released, on this ordinary criminal trial would be a threat to the national security of the country. We are campaigning and still campaigning to get those papers released. We had a debate in Parliament January 23rd, 2014. There was a full debate. It took three hours. Dave Anderson, the MP for Blaine in the North East, opened up that debate and that debate as I say ran for three hours with everybody there getting and, and it really gelled again it gelled the parliamentary Labour Party that did on that day I was there to witness it but you had an MP for Aldershot Sir Gerald Howarth I think it was his attitude to the pickets that really gelled the Labour Party. Because true Tory, true conservatism come out from that man. He, even on the day, using parliamentary privilege by the way, said that we had killed somebody on the Brookside site. These were the words he used. We had killed someone on site. I remember saying to Ricky, are you aware of that, Ricky? Ricky said, I don't think even the police are aware of that one. <laughs> but these are the kind of things that come out from the Tory party. And his viciousness. Him and his new young wife, he said, when the strikes were on in the early 70s, they were filling their cupboards with food in case there was a shortage. Well, some people couldn't even buy food to put in the cupboard. But he was stockpiling. This is the kind of things that come out from that Tory MP. But that debate, after three hours, the vote was taken, and it was 124 the release of the papers to three against. And the government still wouldn't release the papers. No, you can't have those papers. I don't know why we have these parliamentary debates because the government don't pay any attention to them anyway. But throughout all this, initially when we were put on trial in 1972 and 73 in those early years, the unions, UCAT, construction, TNT, GMB, they wouldn't give us any support. But the support came from the rank and file, people like yourselves in this room, from all over the country. They sent us money every week. It came through to our treasurer of our North Wales Action Committee. And every picket that was put on trial, having lost work to be on trial, all expenses were paid for travelling up, and their wives were paid 
what wages they would have earned if they'd have been in work. Not one picket, it's not even me as a single lad, not one picket went short. And that was through the generosity of the rank and file and the working class movements of this uh, country that I'm proud to be a member of. I've been around in local politics, I've been around the Labour Party, and I've been around the trade unions in Wales over 50 years now. There's people in the room I know from different events that I've been to. But the rank and file have been there all the time. And now again, we are hoping, because we've been given cryptic clues, that our case has been put back to the CCRC in April 2012. We will have a decision in late June. It's cryptically coming out from the CCRC. I think it's a bit of a coincidence, maybe, that in late June is going to be the decision on the EU referendum. And maybe it's a good time to bury stuff. That's my cynical view. Maybe it's a good time to bury stuff. But we certainly will be looking for money to go back to the Court of Appeal. We've got money coming in now through various collections and we sell goods such as t-shirts and uh, books. We sell, we sell all kinds of different merchandise to people to raise our money because we have to pay bindings our solicitors now. We pay them on a monthly basis. But come late June, if we're given that freedom back to the Court of Appeal, then we'll need to pay barristers. <coughs> And that's why we've got a book it's somewhere down here. It's been around on the mass today. Just looking for a few little bits of collections from people to try to help us in that way. Unite, RMT, GMB, Unison, UCAT, all the major unions, they've all signed up and pledged that they will be there. We've got that backing now from the major unions that they will be there to give us our support. And that's, it's, it's fantastic. I, I, I think about different things that's happened over the, over the years, but one of the most memorable, and I, I, I won't take too much time now, Chair. One of the most memorable was when we served the, 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 the papers that we had for the uh, signatures for the campaign when we served them on 10 Downing Street in December 2013. We went down to Downing Street, a delegation went down to serve these papers. Ricky had a big bundle of papers in front of him. They turned around and they were posing, Christmas tree to the side of them, they were posing by the front door of number 10. And then Ricky says, do I knock this knocker or what do I do? <laughs> and Bob Crow, God bless that man, Bob Crow said, kick the fucker down! <laughs> <laughs>